Jim McCarthy back with you. Today we're going to talk about commercial ventilation. It's the next part in our series. Um, ventilation, what is ventilation? Ventilation is the V in HVAC. It's also uh, how the su uh, supply of outdoor air is to the indoor space, either by a natural means or a mechanical means. And that's where it's broken down into two groups. Um, you've got your natural means, open doors, windows, um, things like that, or you got fans from mechanical means. So let's jump in here and talk about what we've got. We've got natural ventilation. Here you see that you can open up some windows at the top here. Um, natural ventilation is ventilation that occurs primarily through open windows, doors, um, or infiltration through cracks above doors and uh, windows, things like that, any penetrations through walls or ceilings, the gaps around those penetrations may cause um, uh, uh, air to penetrate. Uh, natural ventilation is driven by uh, air, wind, uh, pressure, and temperature differences, the temperature differences between the outside temperature and the inside temperature of a building. Um, I think we have another slide here. Let's see, yes. Um, here we've got a bunch of windows that are openable windows at the top of this entryway in this office complex. More natural ventilation. Um, so basically opening doors, windows, and then the crack seepages around doors, windows, and penetrations is what we call, determine natural ventilation. Uh, mechanical ventilation, uh, this is outside air that is... Um, delivered indoors, typically through fan, a fan or fans, uh, and draws from outside air and forces it through the ducts to the place where people are occupied, um, occupants are located. So the mechanical ventilation can increase infiltration and or exfiltration. Uh, and if there's any leaks in the ducts, that can also increase the ventilation rates. Uh, ventilation rates. Let's talk a little bit about ventilation rates. Um, these rates um, are expressed the flow, uh, the flow rate from outside air brought inside, inside the building. Uh, they are typically nominalized by the volume of space being ventilized. So um, it depends on the area, the size of the area that you're trying to ventilate, um, such as Changes in air per hour uh, is one designation. Then you have uh, another by the floor being ventilated is cubic foot per minute, or normally known as a CFM. CFM is cubic foot per minute. So, uh, or these number, it could be the number of people being served would be the CFM per person. Um, we'll get into that here in a little bit. Let's, uh, let's show a slide here that... Uh, roof ventilation, excuse me, roof ventilation, same, same situation. We've got uh, roof blowers that are sucking in air. Uh, this happens to be a roof ventilation uh, picture. And we've got roof exhaust ex as well. So this is exhausting air from the building coming out. Um, here's the picture I was looking for, excuse me. So in talking about this, these rates and these uh, changes of air, cubic foot per minute, CFMs, uh, and CFM per person. They're standards, and these standards of ventilation rates um, and codes. And the standards and codes are established for a minimum ventilation rates to protect human health. Um, an attempt is made to balance health and productivity benefits of increased ventilation and use of energy. Uh, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers, or the A-S-H-R-A-E, um, which we see here, these guys um, have developed the standards for minimum ventilation rates. And um, for many different kinds of buildings and spaces. So uh, municipalities and other code-making uh, organizations may use these AS. HRAE standards as guidelines for their code enforcements, for their enforcing codes for ventilation. 
Uh, typically, the minimum ventilation rate in standards and codes specify minimum ventilation rates uh, per person per unit floor area that vary with the type of building and the space used and its usage. So they've set up a, a guideline in this, uh, this rates chart kind of explains what we got going on. Uh, education is broken down into classrooms and art classrooms, uh, multi-use assembly uh, uh, areas, lecture classrooms, and then you've got bars, cocktail lounges. It's just all broken down in what kind of an area that uh, you're dealing with. And then the AST, ASHRAE rates, uh, and this is ventilation rate required CFMs per 1,000 square foot. So this is a good chart. Uh, it kind of tells what is required and the amounts of areas that's, that's being required to be ventilated. So these are the uh, ASHRAE uh, guidelines and, and uh, ratings. We also talked about uh, air changes. And here's a little graph that demonstrates air changes um, using the ASHRAE 62 rates uh, in an office building, for instance. Just thought I'd show you what that pans out to be. So you can read the sides there, pollutant level factor, and then you've got air changes per hour, or ACH. Um, let's talk about some heat recovery ventilators. Uh, a heat recovery ventilator, or HRV, has a heat recovery core in the center, as you can see in this picture here, and fans on each end to bring in fresh air and exhaust stale indoor air. So you see how this diagram has it going through the uh, core there. Um, the HRV brings in fresh outside air, which is drawn through filters and the heat exchange core, which we see in the middle, and uh, where it is heated to a, by stale outgoing air. Um, this saves considerable energy, and the HRV distributes this preheated air uh, throughout the ductwork of a forced air system or through a series of ducts, uh, if you don't have the forced air system, that are installed especially for the use of an HRV. Um, in concurrent with the HRV, we've got, um, let me see if i got some pictures here. Yeah, here's a couple pictures of them. You see the vents of the incoming and outgoing air brings it through the core. Same situation, a couple different manufacturers. Um, along with these HRVs, we'll have energy recovery. And here's a diagram showing the energy recovery. Um, and the energy recovery basically is energy recovery, recovery ventilators, or ERVs, uh, bring in outside air that is filtered, cooled, and dehumidified. And that's basically the difference in the two, is that you're using um, the core um, uh, by the stale outgoing air is how they're cooled, and s similar with the HRVs. So these two work in conjunction. Um, much like an HRV, the ERV air passes through an energy recovery core. And the energy recovery ventilator then distributes the cooled, dehumidified air throughout the ductwork and the system. And uh, I do have a picture of the core of the energy recovery unit. So same scenario, air comes in, goes through the recovery unit, goes through the filter, and then exits with the um, cooled, uh, dehumidified, which is a big deal uh, in a lot of office buildings for sure, uh, system that goes into the duct and then is distributed through the building or the office. Um, airtight is, um, is becoming more and more of a problem. I'm gonna speak about that for just a second. Um, as the buildings become more airtight for heat loss uh, and move more insulation to combat heating costs, uh, they create a ventilation problem. And uh, buildings must have some air movement uh, of, for new and fresh air to breathe, as well as motion of air, and that combats the molds, bacteria, uh, allergens, things like that, that are productive and grow in low ventilated areas or non-ventilated. Uh, motion in some areas. There's not, no ventilation at all. So that's where those 
type of things are very productive, so you need ventilation to prevent those. Um, some things that can happen because you don't have the ventilation are VOCs. And here's a good picture of a, a metal studded building. These are metal studs, of course, and you've got some electric boxes, but the drywall's been taken off. Of course, here you can see the insulation is molded and the drywall is definitely molded. So there was some sort of a leak here possibly, but everything inside this wall is completely mold and molded. So you've, you've got people in this building that are breathing the mold. Um, the VOC uh, is a very common and not necessarily mold, but there's different components, there's different toxins. Uh, we'll talk about that here. Um, air quality is important to human health because individuals spend large portions of their time indoors uh, at their residence, schools, workplaces, things like that. In addition, there are a number of sources of airborne toxic pollutants. These indoor environments where outdoor air ventilation provides the only means to dilute the pollutant concentrations. So you've got to have some kind of air in there to, to deal with these type of indoor uh, volatile organic compounds, which is VA, VOC. Um, VOCs are one class of indoor pollutants and they may cause irritation to building occupants. We'll get into that here in just a little bit. Um, so these are things that you won't know about. You won't see the mold from the outside. It doesn't penetrate through the paint. If it does, it's a real problem. But this is inside the interior of the wall. That's why this picture is great as you see the the drywall molding on the other side and rotting through, and then you see all the mold on the insulation and the drywall here. Um, VOC states. Um, this diagram is a diagram that shows um, the compliance with the EPA. Uh, looks like some cities over here, states over here, and California. Um, states switching over to DOC. VOC regulations. There are different regulations to monitor this because it's become such a problem. Um, in the white area, most all the states currently follow US EPA AIM VOCs. So most everybody's on board with this problem. Uh, it's become a nationwide problem in buildings and commercial properties. Um, so it's been addressed and it's, it's definitely a, a situation uh, that you will possibly run into in some of your inspections. So I just wanted to make you aware of what, what we're talking about. Um, also, we've got uh, sick building syndrome, or SBS, which is another very large uh, factor. Uh, sick building syndrome is another air quality problem. Uh, characteristics of building, buildings and indoor environments have been linked to the prevalence of acute building-related health syndromes. Uh, these symptoms are often called sick building syndrome symptoms um, experienced by building occupants, and they don't know why. Um, it could very well be because of this picture we have here. Um, you can see a normal duct, what a normal duct looks like, or what this duct in particular looks like when it's clean or when it was first installed. Over time and over the years, you can see the buildup of dust, uh, pollutants, particles, molds, allergens, whatever. There's a wide number of things in here. As the air passes through it, it's bringing these particles of air with this mold or uh, contaminants into the building, into the office space. Um, what happens is um, people get, it, it, it irritates some people more than others. Um, you have symptoms may include uh, irritation of eyes, nose, skin. You may have headaches, um, fatigue. Uh, even difficulty breathing from people with have asthma or some difficulty anyway, then you introduce this type of a, of a situation where they've got extra things they're breathing in. It can, it can really affect some people. Uh, in offices, it's really noticeable when you go to the same office every day and you sit at your desk and you've got the vent blowing right on you, you're getting subjected to this. So this has become a big problem. Uh, symptoms improve uh, when the occupant leaves. Uh, uh, there's no, and gets away from the building, and there's no related uh, disease or exposure known to cause their symptoms other than the building. Um, so that, that's hence the name sick building syndrome. Uh, 
This is a big cause of the sick building syndrome. Um, now, how do we combat that? Um, well, here's another diagram that also goes into the airborne particles um, and the dust, the mold, the mites, um, just different, different things that can cause these uh, VOCs, which is uh, what we were talking about. And then the S SBS, sick building syndromes, also have some of the things I talked about, um, eyes, ears, nose, throat, fatigue, uh, memory impairment, headaches, coughing, wheezing. Um, so there's a whole spectrum of your body parts that are affected by this, not just your lungs and breathing, but um, different people have different um, effects from these syndromes. So we want to try and uh, do without them. And filtration is how we do that. Uh, fil filters and other particle air cleaners are used exclusively in buildings to remove particles from incoming outdoor air from recirculating air indoors. Um, historically, filters were installed to remove the accumulation of deposited particles uh, on HVAC equipment, which diminished the flow rates and impeded the heat transfer. Uh, within the last two decades, the potential benefits of, to health have been increasingly recognized as a primary purpose for filters. So the reason we use filters today is to combat some of these issues that I've just talked about, the VOCs and the SBS syndromes, uh, rather than before they were used to keep particles and contaminants out away from the HVAC equipment. So I think we've, we've come full circle. We've, we've realized now that we need to keep the outdoor air out and all the particles away from um, the components that operate the HVAC equipment. Um, one way to do that uh, is regular filters, and you see some filters here before it goes up into the ducts. These large areas here are filters before it goes up into the huge duct system that we have here in this building. Um, another one is electrostatic filters, and electrostatic filters are more common nowadays. Um, the electrostatic filter uses electrostatically charged polypropylene and polyurethane filtration medias to attract particles as small as 0.3 microns. Now, a micron equals 1 one twenty-five thousandths of an inch. So if you can imagine, 1 one twenty-five thousandths of an inch uh, is 1 micron. We're talking about 0.3 microns. So we're talking extremely non-visible particles that these electrostatic filters can trap and contain before they become airborne into the buildings. Um, a safe static charge produced by forcing air across the filter. And this static charge attracts and traps the airborne particles into a filter just like a magnet does. So it pulls them in and holds them there until it can be cleaned. But the, the, the thing that has to happen on these is that they're cleaned periodically. Uh, there'll be these shields here or these uh, deals will be, uh, these filters um, will be particleized so badly that they can't attract any more particles. So maintenance on them is extremely important. So therefore, you've got to um, have the maintenance company has to be aware of and realize that they're um, electrostatic filters and have to be cleaned periodically, whatever the case may be due to the size and uh, the amount of people in the building. That brings us to the end of this segment of commercial ventilation. Um, we could go into a lot more detail about some of the other syndromes and causes of the sick building syndromes and things like that, but basically this is what you need to know as far as the ventilation goes of your commercial property. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. Dan McCarthy.